Welcome back to Content Cathedral. I'm your host, C. Alex Smith. You can reach me at author C. Alex Smith at gmail.com. This is story developer number seven, putting it all together, part one. In this episode, we will take a look at how the major plot points affect the various story arcs up to the midpoint. For these next two episodes, I relied heavily on Larry Brooks, who wrote Story Engineering, and a series of posts by C.S. Plotcher on her website, writinglikerolling.com. I believe her analysis of Rowling's writing comes from Stuart Horowitz's book, Architecture. But I haven't read that book yet, so I can neither recommend it nor tell you to skip it. Links to all these resources will be provided in the show notes. Back in story developer number four, we talked about the three arcs. Everyone has to have a narrative arc. This is all the action that takes place in your story. When we say plot, It is the narrative arc that most people are thinking about, and this arc answers the question, what changes in the world of your story? While the narrative arc deals with what happens externally to your character, it is the character arc that deals with what happens between your character's ears, how your character's emotions and worldview change over the course of the story. This arc answers the question, Who is the protagonist becoming? Most, but not all, stories will have some character arc. Finally, a few writers like to deal heavily in the thematic arc. This arc deals with the values that most humans hold dear. Values are universally desirable attributes like love, self-worth, abundance. Symbols and metaphors understood by a large segment of the culture are used to represent these values. The thematic arc provides the story with meaning, and most stories have at least some element of thematic arc. Although the meaning might be very simple and the theme may not be a prominent feature. Thematic arc addresses questions about the interaction between the very private world of the soul and the very public world of society, and thus answers the question, why should I care? In order for your story to work, these three arcs must change slowly in a pattern that readers can comprehend. There are various ways to look at the global story structure, but the structure remains the same, only the ways of seeing the complexity of the story change. Almost all novels, plays, and screenplays follow this pattern, more or less. There are exceptions, but remember, the masters flaunt the rules and are able to get around them with immense talent and skill. They do understand the general pattern of plot, and so should you. Plot pattern is marked by story events, high-tension scenes in which fortunes turn dramatically in new directions. These reversals compel your main character to make choices that have clear consequences. Those decisions reveal the character's innermost thoughts and motivations the core of his being. Though the pattern is the same for most stories, it is complex and there is a multitude of ways of breaking it down to examine its structure. The plot whisperer, save the cat, story, the hero's journey, and many, many more excellent books have been written about story structure. For my purposes here, I'm going to talk about the eight moments in your story I consider to be the major plot points. These most closely match the ones discussed in in Story Engineering by Larry Brooks. To aid in our discussion, I'll be using a popular movie to illustrate the classic plot points. 
So if you haven't seen the original Star Wars movie, this is the time to shut off your computer because I'm going to totally spoil it for you. George Lucas famously used The Hero's Journey to create the film, and the plot points are very prominent and easy to spot, making this a good film for this discussion. In case it's been a few years since you viewed this film, here is a recap. Princess Leia, a prominent rebel against an evil empire, has just been captured by Darth Vader. She sneaks stolen plans for the Death Star into her trusted robot R2-D2. The small, domed robot escapes to Tatooine with its android companion, C-3PO. The bots end up in the service of Luke Skywalker. Luke, a wet-behind-the-ears kid, lives on his uncle's moisture farm, but he dreams of leaving Tatooine for adventure. When R2-D2 escapes to find the retired rebel Obi-Wan Kenobi and deliver Leia's message, Luke follows to recapture the wayward droid. Obi-Wan tells Luke about his father, leaving out all the dark side stuff. Obi-Wan tries to convince Luke to fight with the rebels, but Luke declines. When Luke gets home, the Empire has killed his family, and he has no choice but to follow Obi-Wan off Tatooine. Luke, Obi-Wan, and the droids hook up with rogue smuggler Han Solo for a flight on the Millennium Falcon, so they can get to Alderaan, find the princess, and deliver the plans to the Rebellion. Meanwhile, Darth Vader's Death Star proves it's the ultimate power in the universe by destroying Alderaan in one shot. The Falcon comes out of hyperspace into the rubble, and the ship is captured by the Empire. Obi-Wan escapes the Millennium Falcon to sneak around the Death Star and shut down the force field so the Falcon and passengers can escape. Before Obi-Wan can get back to the Millennium Falcon, he is struck down by Vader. The Millennium Falcon does manage to deliver the plans for the Death Star to the Rebellion forces, due largely to Obi-Wan's sacrifice. The Rebels plot an attack that involves dropping a laser bomb into a tiny vent shaft to destroy the Death Star. Solo disappoints Luke when he declines to participate in this suicide mission, but Solo shows up during the battle just in time to save Luke's life. After a failed attempt, Luke uses the Force to destroy the Death Star. He and Han are awarded medals by Princess Leia and the Grateful Rebels. Now, let's break that down a little. The first plot point is the hook. The purpose of the hook is to incite curiosity in the reader. It should ask a compelling question the reader yearns to answer something that forces the reader to turn pages seeking that answer. This scene should promise the reader an intense and rewarding read. It needs to be visceral, impacting the main character at the gut level. It needs to be sensual, impacting all the senses to seat the reader in the main character's body immediately. It needs to be emotionally resonant, capturing the reader with some emotional value at stake. As a young person sitting in the darkened theater, I can't tell you what it was like when that huge ship came over my head, rumbling the speakers as it fired on the tiny ship in front of it. Vader's ship just went on forever, and no one had ever seen anything like this in the theater. Everyone in the theater leaned forward, excited, and brimming with curiosity. What was this fight about? Who was the good guy and who the villain? It only got more interesting when we saw Princess Leia giving her robot something in an urgent fashion. Now, if you're not as old as me, Star Wars may seem rather hokey, but at the time, the only thing that could possibly be compared to seeing the inside of a spaceship with a robot was silent running. And this was a huge step up from Silent Running. Okay, enough nostalgia about Star Wars. Let's talk about your novel. In the hook, 
you don't want much explanation. In fact, you want to start in medias res, or in the middle of things. Let the reader figure out what's going on with well-placed, subtle clues. Use an ominous setting or situation, if you possibly can, to imply risk to important stakes or human values. Try to start with motion. In literature, changing emotion or, or dialogue with a lot of conflict can act like motion. You also want to make sure, at this point, you give the reader adequate setting to picture your world, place, time, weather, and immediate context. To start the character arc, make sure you give the reader the main character's observable qualities. Hints to age, IQ, sex, sexuality, style of speech, gestures, choice of car, choice of home, dress, educational level, occupation, values, attitudes, things you would notice about a person if you met them for the first time. You also want to show the reader the main character's flaw and make sure the reader bonds to the main character. Some ways to achieve a bond between reader and main character is to make the reader identify with the character. Make the reader feel like they could wind up in the same situation. That makes them empathize with an everyman character. Readers also bond easily with a sympathetic character. A person in jeopardy, facing some hardship or vulnerable in some way, or an underdog. Princess Leia certainly fits this description, at least at the onset of the movie. Likeable characters also draw readers in. Main characters who are witty show that they don't take themselves too seriously. Some main characters save the cat with an early act of kindness to someone less powerful. Engaging protagonists who unselfishly care for others without calling attention to themselves draw us in. Main characters with an expansive view of life can also capture a reader's attention. Finally, characters in strong inner conflict struggling with two voices in their heads are sympathetic to most readers. In these first few scenes, you should also foreshadow how the character will change in the end of the story. Show the main character's baseline emotional state and his goal. Hint at his strengths and his flaws, but keep the backstory out of it at this point. I'll show you some places to put backstory later. Show the character unable to do something due to a critical flaw in his character. I won't spend a great deal of time on the theme arc in these videos. Most of us don't know what the theme is until at least the first draft is done, and sometimes it only becomes clear after several drafts. Even if you are not writing a story that is heavily thematic, your opening scenes make a promise to the reader. Part of that bargain is being very clear about what type of book the reader is embarking upon. Give the reader clear direction about the tone, funny, dramatic, tragic, tense, and genre, romance, adventure, thriller, sci-fi, the first few scenes of Star Wars involve spaceships, lasers, robots, and secret plans. That makes it clear that this is going to be a sci-fi action adventure. If that's not what you signed up for, you still have time to take your popcorn to the lobby and demand your money back. Shortly after the opening is a good time to show how the main character society is making their personal problems worse. If you know how your story will end, put some hint in the first chapter. Hints are also called foreshadowing, but be careful not to give away too much, or the reader will guess the ending. If you do happen to know the theme, you can put the controlling idea or the counter-controlling idea in the first scene as well. In a murder mystery, 
The counter-controlling idea might be something like crime pays because criminals are smart and ruthless. The next chapter would then be dedicated to the controlling idea. Crime doesn't pay because law enforcement is even more brilliant and or ruthless. If you are writing a story with a thick theme and you already know what that theme is, you must avoid putting a moral to the story in the first few scenes. That's called authorial intrusion, and it makes the story sound preachy, and nobody wants to read a preachy book. After you've hooked the reader and let them settle into your story world, it's time for the first major story event, the inciting incident. The inciting incident upsets the main character's status quo and sets in motion the events that will eventually launch the main character on some unforeseen path. Frequently, this scene is also the first scene of the novel and serves as a hook as well. In our example plot, the inciting incident is the moment that Luke sees a partial message from Princess Leia, drawing him into the rebellion. As the main character moves forward, the plot accelerates. The protagonist learns the scope of the problem, meets other characters who will help him on the way, but has some conflicts with them instead of teaming up with them right away to achieve his goal. As I mentioned earlier, after you briefly establish the main character's ordinary world, you want to turn it upside down. The inciting incident presents a new problem for the main character. In the hero's journey, this is also named a call to action or call to adventure. The main character must make a decision and he frequently makes the wrong decision prior to making the right decision. So you also have to show the stakes involved for the character in this decision. When we get hit by something out of left field, we have to take a moment to regroup. Even in a positive event like winning the lottery, the main character loses something of himself and his world coping with the changes around him. The decisions the main character makes in such moments show his heart and soul. On the thematic front, the inciting incident creates a question for the reader as well. That question is the main story question that the reader has to read to the end of the novel in order to answer. The theme is glimpsed by the reader and the human value at stake is revealed. The main character's flaw shows the negative version of that value and the antagonist personifies the main character's flaw. The inciting incident promises the reader a specific crisis and climax by pointing to the change that must occur by the end of the novel. The main character will be tested by the negative value at the crisis point, and the results of that test will be shown at the climax. The reader knows those scenes must play out or the book has not ended. After the main character recovers from the initial shock of the inciting incident, he starts to deny that any change is necessary. He pretends everything is as it was. For the hero about to undergo a journey, this may come as a refusal to the call for adventure. Luke does this in Obi-Wan's cave-like home. The denial draws the reader in further, wondering how this denial will haunt him in the future. From the inciting incident to the end of Act 1, the main character's familiar world contracts and no longer quite fits. He begins to consider leaving his familiar world for a new world. When I say the main character is leaving the old world, this need not be a physical journey. The character might embark on falling in love. That is definitely a journey towards change, but it frequently does not require relocation. If the main character resists the journey towards change, a mentor figure may show up to give him a little push. If the main character is eager for change, his friends from the old world try to talk some sense into him and dissuade him from leaving the old world for the new. 
early obstacles establish the stakes and the values that are at risk for this character in these first few scenes. This acceleration builds tension until it explodes, launching the main character into a new and exotic world. Again, this new world is a metaphor and does not require a change in location. Being served divorce papers would be an excellent example of an Act 1 climax as it should shift the context of the story from setup to response, the real beginning of the story. Instead of a literal explosion, the climax of Act 1 can be very subtle and not at all a dramatic scene, like a man seeing the love of his life for the first time. It can also be a series of scenes that fall about at the quarterway point through the word count. Typically, this is a realization scene. It is an aha moment when readers and the main character understand the true nature of the dilemma. This is a game changer. It locks in the central drama and alters the way the protagonist pursues the goal from that moment on. It is important that this moment represents a one-way door. Some consequence forces the character to commit to achieving a specific goal. As a result, the main character embarks on a plan or makes a decision that commits him or her to engage in the central conflict, and we get our first real view of the antagonist, understanding what he or she or it wants and how that conflicts with the main character's goal. With your main character's sense of self shaken, denial stops working. The narrative dilemma narrows all choices until the main character must face a type of death. This may be actual physical death, but commonly it's more metaphorical than that, such as professional death or spiritual death. At this point, the reader is also having their own realization. They begin to understand the meaning of the story and the values that are being argued over. At an intuitive level, they understand the controlling and counter-controlling ideas, and they are ready to see the argument play out to the finish line. As we step over the threshold from Act 1 to Act 2, the overall value of the story usually becomes darker and more negative. For example, in a crime drama, this is when the body is typically discovered. The world has gone from a world with justice to one where one person, the victim, has suffered a great deal of injustice. Now the forces of justice and crime must argue their cases and the reader will see who wins at the climax. In our Star Wars example, Luke is offered a chance to go with his mentor Obi-Wan Kenobi, but he declines. On his face, however, we can see he wants to go. He knows there is a world out there and he wants to be part of the action. He wants to find the princess. Later, he returns home to find it burned to the ground by stormtroopers, and his aunt and uncle are murdered. Now homeless, he takes Obi-Wan up on his offer and prepares to leave his home world. As the main character enters this new exotic world, the old rules and beliefs no longer apply, and there is a moment of disorientation. Other characters are introduced that help the main character out. A mentor character might show up at this time as well. Initially, the main character takes the path of least resistance, or exhausts the easiest and most obvious options first. The antagonistic force provides further complication, as increasing obstacles separate the main character from his goal. He and his comrades try to solve the problem, but instead make the problem worse, typically. It is about this time the main character needs some motivation to keep the story going. Many things can push your protagonist into action, but for story's sake, one thing will keep the plot and the main character moving. The antagonist or villain. 
At some point, the reader needs to be reminded about your antagonist. Those times where the antagonist really gets to hog the scene and strut his stuff are called pinch points because the antagonist is goosing your main character. As the main character seeks his goal, he is bound to make some enemies. This plot point belongs to those enemies. The antagonist gets to strut his stuff and cause a major loss to the protagonist. In some genres, he may even make the conflict personal. For example, up to now the conflict has been because the main character occupied a certain job or is part of some group. Now the antagonist makes the conflict about some characteristic only the main character possesses and usually something dear to the main character's heart. This raises the stakes for the main character, but if the main character is not properly motivated, doesn't have a reason to stick around and engage in all this conflict, then the main character might just quit. So there also has to be some reason the main character can't leave the conflict and is stuck to the antagonist despite the unpleasant circumstances. From a character perspective, the antagonist is there to aggravate the main character's flaw and create imbalance in the main character. The main character trips over his flaw again and again, causing strain to his relationships, which makes them deeper or breaks them entirely. All this outer conflict is sure to create some inner conflict as well, as the stakes are raised on the inside as well as on the outside. Suddenly, a deeper, previously hidden side of the main character, which contrasts, if not outright contradicts, the personality the main character shows to the world. That makes this the perfect time to throw in a little backstory to make the main character's erratic behavior sympathetic. Just like the pinch points belong to the antagonist, it also belongs to counter-thematic ideas or counter-controlling ideas. Counter-controlling ideas might be like crime really does pay or love cannot conquer all. This counter-idea is usually tied to the main character's worst fear. Just like the main character, the reader is glimpsing the worst possible ending for the novel. This foreshadowing of the incorrect ending makes the reader feel like the novel might just end the wrong way. That possibility fills the reader with angst. Because the reader becomes uncertain, they must answer the question of how the novel ends, and they keep reading. Not really related to the pinch point, but around this time, you want to make support characters and subplots that symbolically represent various facets of the arguments around the theme. For example, a main character seeking a long-term intimate relationship may have a friend who is a playa. Lucas makes it very clear who is the antagonist in his Star Wars trilogy by dressing Darth Vader completely in black from head to toe, while his heroes are dressed in white. Though we have seen Darth Vader already in the movie, the pinch point is where Lucas makes it clear that this is a villain like none other. In this scene, Vader brings Princess Leia to Governor Tarkin for an interrogation. Tarkin threatens to blow up the princess's homeworld of Alderaan if she does not give up the location of the rebel base. With the lives of everyone on her home world on the line, Princess Leia tells Tarkin the rebels are on Dantooine. And just to prove Tarkin and Vader are evil to the core, they blow up Alderaan anyway. Later, we find out, Princess Leia has given the villains the wrong address for the rebel base. Princess Leia is a stakes character in this scene. She faces the stakes when the main character, Luke, cannot be around because he is still en route to the Death Star. Finally, we are at the halfway point. Whole books have been written about the midpoint. Two of my favorites are Write Your Novel from the Middle by James Scott Bell and The Midpoint by Mary Mercer. 
The end of Act 1 launched her main character on a quest for a goal, which has gotten him into a great deal of trouble in this new exotic world. There have been consequences to this quest, and now your character faces one of three types of death. In an action-adventure or plot-driven story where your character is not particularly introspective, he may actually literally face death. In that case, the midpoint is the moment your hero considers whether or not he or she can actually survive the circumstances you have thrust upon him. In most novels, with a character-driven element, however, this is metaphorical death. Death of a previously successful or hoped-for professional life. Death of a previous identity. Death of the spirit. I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times. Novels are about change. For many stories, the midpoint is a mirror moment. A moment when the protagonist pauses to consider what he or she is becoming or should become. In the narrative arc of the midpoint mirror, something new usually enters the story at this point. A betrayal, a revelation, or a profound disappointment adds more weight to the main character and tensions rise. This change does not change the facts of the story, only reveal meaning. Changes our understanding of the context of the story. Suddenly, the reader sees a whole new layer of meaning on this story. The catalyst that adds new perspective activates new behaviors. The main character recommits to a goal, or a resistant main character willingly and consciously commits for the first time to the goal. Loyalties shift, and characters who relied on the main character's flaw may change from allies to antagonists. There may be a major falling out between some of the character's allies. Finally, this change sets in motion the events that lead to the final climax of the story. Due to all this stress, your character is experiencing his flaw in the most pronounced way. The midpoint comes to an end when your character realizes he has to make a change to his inner self to change his outer circumstances. The midpoint is where the final foreshadowing occurs. At this point, the reader sees the worst possible ending to the story and worries that this will indeed be the ending. But the reader also realizes that the main character has been putting on an act for the first half of the book and that they are much stronger, kinder, better, darker, more flawed than they initially appeared. At or about this point, the thematic story will start to emphasize progression. There are many types of progression. For example, in social progression, the impact of the problem presented to the main character in the inciting incident rises from his personal life to affect those close to the character and eventually to affect society as a whole. In personal progression, the impact of the problem goes from superficially affecting the main character with what appears to be a solvable problem to a deeper, more intricate problem affecting the protagonist's psyche emotionally, morally, or psychologically. Finally, in symbolic ascension, actions, locations, roles, and or objects representing only themselves in a mundane way, at the beginning of the story, slowly take on greater meaning until they represent universal ideas associated with the story premise or values. In Star Wars, the midpoint starts with Luke sparring with a remote wearing a blast shield over his eyes. Ben tells him to stretch out with your feelings, and Luke successfully parries three blasts in a row. Han Solo calls this luck, but Ben tells Luke that he has taken his first steps into a larger world. Luke's mirror moment is a glimpse of the Jedi Master he will one day become. Immediately after this calm scene, Three bad things happen in quick succession. First, Tarkin discovers that Leia has lied about the location of the rebel base and gives the order to terminate her immediately. This ticking clock raises the tension. 
Second, the Millennium Falcon comes out of hyperspace into the rubble that was once Alderaan. This means they will not be able to deliver R2-D2's plans to Leia's father, the rebel leader. Third, their ship is caught in a tractor beam and sucked into the Death Star, entering a regimented, fortified, and militarized world of the opponent. This is a stark world full of vague symbolism of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Stakes are successfully raised, and the symbolic ascension has been delivered. That's a lot to take in, so I think I'll take a break and give you a chance to digest all of that. Thanks for watching the Story Development Series by Content Cathedral. Next time, we will conclude the series with part two of Putting It All Together. If you are a writer and you want to join Content Cathedral, drop me a line at my email, authorcalexsmith at gmail.com. You'll get access to the website, monthly hangouts with other writers, and announcements when we have more video lessons.